Welcome again to another special edition of Guest of the Month. Guest of the Month is done once every month under the League of Genuine Discussions with me, Fred Mwema, and we have this discussion to supplement, to complement, to add to our usual discussions uh, on counterfeits, fake products, and fake services that are rampant on the market. This week, we have, or in this episode, we have a very special guest, uh, a man, a son of the soil, a businessman, an entrepreneur, an industrialist, a private sector leader who is going to be discussing with us for the next couple of minutes their experience, their ideas, their opinions about this important subject of counterfeits. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Dr. Patrick Bitature. We've been hosting doctors here, Dr. So and so. So another doctor here for you. Uh, Dr. Patrick Bitature, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everybody. I am sure Dr. Patrick Bitature is not new to many of you, but for those who do not know him, he is uh, a leading uh, entrepreneur and businessman in the East African region. He is chairman of the Simba Group of Companies. Uh, he is in the hospitality business. He owns uh, the Protea Hotel where we are shooting from right now. Uh, he is in power generation. He is chairman of Umeme. He's former chairman, private sector foundation. I've just learned now that he's, I think, chairman of the board of Mlago Hospital now. Not chairman, a director on the board. He's a, a <laughs> new director now uh, on the board of Mlago Hospital and many, many other uh, places. So it would be very interesting to find out uh, what you think about this subject uh, of counterfeits. Uh, the subject of counterfeits, Patrick, is uh, one that is ignored. It is not given the due attention uh, that it requires. So the purpose of this discussion here is to create more awareness and enlightenment about this menace, which we take the view that it has concealed dangers that are harming both our health and wealth. So Patrick, you are very, very active in public speaking, in uh, motivational speaking. You're always out there uh, speaking about financial literacy, money. I have seen one of your videos which went viral uh, on money investment. And uh, I would like to know this attention that you pay to money. Uh, some people say money is the root of all evil. I think even somewhere in the Bible, First <laughs> Timothy, they say, you know, money is the root of all evil. Uh, do you abandon your Christian values when you are advocating for money and its management? Fred, an interesting question and uh, a classic one. First of all, let's make no mistake. Money is just an intermediary. Money is like a tool. It's not an end on its own. And money can be used for good or for evil. And the search for money can lead people to do things that are evil or good. I try to encourage people to do things that are good, to solve problems, so problems that are in our society. And the bigger the problem you solve, the more money most of the time that you will make. So look at the problem. Your focus should be on the problem. And how can you make a difference? How can you contribute to solving that problem? In the process, you make money. Now, people who just take things out of context and say money is the root cause of evil, that's taking something completely out of, evil, out of context. And it is wrong. Relating to the world we're in today, especially, everything has got a role. Spirituality has got a role, a very important role. And we cannot govern a society without that element of spirituality. And it's good that people are grounded, not just because it's for governance, but you must believe in something. You must have roots. You must come from somewhere. I am a strong Christian, and I always have my, my, my rosary nearby, because I believe in something. You can't live by, by money alone and think science and technology will solve all the problems. I see the Western world has moved a bit too far to the right where they believe so much in fixing things themselves without knowing that there is a power beyond them 
that really can, is divine and intervenes with everything. And sometimes they call it luck and they say, oh, this one was just born lucky. No, there is something that we need. And I think spirituality is one of those things. Culture is one of those things. Patriotism for your country is one of those things. I see um, very many countries that have advanced, have moved a bit to the right away from religion. And it's only America that has done so well economically and stayed very Christian, a strong Christian uh, spiritual uh, grounding. The Scandinavian um, countries. They, most of them most moved of away. Them are, and they mm. think that. So only time will tell where they, where, where they stand. You see the Russians, the Chinese, they've embraced technology and, and advancement, and they are downplaying the, the role of spirituality. Good for them. Unfortunately, in Africa, where we, we really are entrenched in spirituality, we're not doing that well. And so there's a bit of a, a contradiction there. <clears throat> but we are using a spirituality. You see people going to the church or mosque, and they, and they are praying to get money. Uh, so whereas... It, that will not be enough on its own. You can't pray to get money. You've got to work to get money. It's good to pray, and it'll give you the opportunity to see opportunity, to see the opportunities, because you might actually miss the best opportunity in front of you. And it's the time's divine wisdom that comes in your way and says, this bottle is going to go so far. Why this bottle? Why this brand? Why MTN? Why a particular product will succeed? And that divine intervention, that which you cannot put your finger on, sometimes people call that lack or spirituality. Or anyway, uh, Patrick, we see that we need to move a bit from that. But mm -hmm. going back to this money root of evil, here uh, on the League of the Genuine, uh, we know that uh, the motivation for people to counterfeit, to duplicate other people's products, mm. to sell the fake products on the market, is because they, they have a profit motive, they have a money motive. Mm. Uh, so to that extent, there might be truth that money can be a, 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 a causative factor for evil, actually. In fact, talking about that, uh, there was a report in the media uh, that I saw saying that uh, they had uh, bust a, a certain group, uh, a, a certain syndicate that was uh, making and selling fake Simba cement, uh, Tororo cement. Those were the two brands. Uh, so was your brand, or was your Simba cement uh, faked as well? Do you have counterfeit Simba cement? First of all, Simba cement is not my business. It's actually a completely separate business. We just have a common name, the word Simba. Oh, I thought all companies with Simba. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. I wish they were, but they are not. Simba okay. Motorcycles, Simba Cement, lately many people think I'm associated with them. They are not. I don't have anything to do with the motorcycles. I don't have anything to do with the cement. People think Simba is a lucky name and they're riding on it. I thought Good with for the them. motorcycles you got that deal. No, the for exclusively for the government. No, many people came after me. Buy a Simba Unfortunately, no. Oh, fortunately, no. Okay, but so if you're not the owner of Simba Cement, mm -hmm. you are still somebody who has, who must have had an experience uh, with counterface in the building and construction, uh, construction uh, sector. Can you share uh, your experience uh, with counterface in the building and construction, if you've had? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, counterfeits are extremely counterproductive. Especially cement. Cement is not just about somebody taking out a few kilos. They used to call it Okokuba Bomba, to take out a few kilos in the bag, because most bag. people just buy the bag of cement and they don't wait again when it's on site. But the danger is when you mix and the ratios are not right, especially when you're building a multi-story building, you're putting so many people's lives at risk. It's very selfish, it's very myopic, it is extremely dangerous. In fact, such a person should be charged for an attempted murder. Because that's what you're trying to do. Because the cement mix, the ratios of cement to sand with the water and the steel you're using, those are carefully, carefully calibrated. Now, when somebody chooses to pull out a few kilos of cement on each bag, by the time you go up a multi-story building, it and just then takes they one add and then it comes chalk down. Or they add yeah, something it's, else. it's terrible to compromise. It's terrible to compromise. So some of these things have been happening. And what surprises me is that in Uganda, Terrible things happen, but it doesn't enrage people. The fury doesn't come out. Something happens and they oh dear, this building collapsed, so many people died, oh dear, and they move on. That fury is not there. We are very timid, very calm people. Our Ubuntu is a bit too much. 
being gifted by nature, we are very calm. Things are done that are terrible in other countries, societies would be up in arms. But somehow, we just continue. But, uh, but Patrick, you have been a business leader in the private sector. Yes. Meaning that you had an opportunity to lead these very calm people, these Ubuntu people, into action. You could call them to action. You've been chairman of the private sector foundation. Uh, so is it that it's not just the people that are too calm and maybe docile, but also the, the leadership? Not just me. I guess that's something everybody Why did you do something? When no, we're all responsible. You can't say, I should be the one because I'm chairman, private sector and I was chairman, or the president is the only one to do this, or the government, or the private sector. You can't finger pinpoint anybody and say that's one or the other. It takes the whole society to have moved together to a certain level of thinking. Let me take you back. There was a lady called Rosa in America who was told in a bus when she boarded a bus to go and sit at the back because she was black. It just happened to be on that day. She was not going to go to the back. She said enough is enough. And from that day on, a revolution began in the whole of America of black empowerment. It took one person, but she was ready to die by the principle. Now the question is, am I going to stand? Or so why going did to you be become one? that Rosa? You've got to be ready to sacrifice, and it's got to be at the right time. In history, certain things happen at the right time. The, the moment must be primed. It is like ready with fuel and just the spark. She was the spark that ignited that movement that caused the liberation of black people. Now, is Uganda ready? No, I don't think so. When will we be ready is the question. So many things happen here that you say, what's wrong with this country? We can be in the middle of a crisis. And there's no money for vaccines. The country is locked down and we decide to buy cars for all the MPs and pay the cash immediately. Yet the one thing we'd be probably focusing on right now should be vaccines. We need vaccines. That's the only way we're going to get back to normal life. The rest of the world is beginning to open up. Indeed, the Delta variant is coming and is challenging the vaccines and the, the, the authenticity of the, of, of the protection it gives us. But we've got to get our priorities right. So there are certain things that our society moves at a different pace at. And you've got to live within the norms, within your society. There are certain things we do here differently. What's happening in South Africa last week, we could see what happened when Zuma was put in prison. Was it just because of Zuma going to prison? An explosion. Maybe it lasted a short while, but there was an implosion within the black community, especially, but also the whites joined in. Now, there were underlying factors that probably were addressing that. So, so we've got to come to the heart of things, the root cause of what happens when it happens. Patrick, uh, the way you are speaking, somebody mm. just listening to you now uh, might think that probably you are just posturing and uh, putting blame on other leaders in the public sector or private sector for not doing their part and so on, not having their rosa moment. But <coughs> you are chairman of Umeme. And uh, a lot of people have issues with Umeme. Uh, Many people say they are, car, they, they are being cheated. Uh, <clears throat> you buy power for so much. The actual that uh, gets used is less, and then it is off. Uh, some meters are fake. Uh, the power is high. This is an area of interest to us as the League of the Genuine, because it also is part of the fakeness we have in the society. Because if I'm buying, uh, I, I, I load 50,000 yaka, and I'm getting 20. Or I only use up to 20. That's fake. W what do you say to that? You see, first of all, I'll declare an interest. I'm the chairman of Umemi. And so whatever I say, I've, uh, I've got to speak within a certain parameter because it's a limited company. But, but Umemi, would you be able to speak the truth? Yes, I have to speak the truth. Others okay. I would not speak at all. I would decline to answer. Okay. Now, Umeme is a limited company. It's licensed. It's got a concession in this country and has done reasonably well in the last 15 years. If people have a very short memory, and that's the difference between us and elephants, and I'll talk about elephants later, because we forget where we are coming from, and the role that Umeme has played in the last 15 years to bring us to where we are. At one time, it was the norm not to have power. And when you have power, power has come. Today it's the opposite. When power goes, people exclaim, exclaim what's happened? Power's gone. And they start sending messages. So we've come from a very low base. And I'm not saying I'm taking credit for that. I am embarrassed that as a Ugandan, we came from a very low base partly because they were, there was very little generation, the, there was no investment in distribution, or very little investment in distribution, and very little investment in transmission. Now, 
our infrastructure had become dilapidated. Now, the easy way to fix it is hit it hard. Invest a lot of money and build a brand new infrastructure. We couldn't afford to do that. The government had other priorities. And the government regulates the price. We don't set the price. Umeme is regulated strictly by the government of Uganda or the Electricity Regulatory Authority, which was created much later. They set the price after factoring in so many things. They make a final decision. We make our inputs, but they have to factor in everything else. And then they get all the, the, the power that's generated. They get a blended price. The cheap power, the expensive power, and the cost of transmitting it, the cost of distributing it, factor it in with a formula. These people have got degrees and masters in what they do. Somebody reads the newspaper and thinks he's an authority and is challenging Ziria, who's the authority in the Electricity Regulatory Authority. She's done her masters. She's studied it. And she arrives at a number scientifically. It cannot be played with. It can be challenged in court by anybody. But she'll defend her position. So we don't set the prices. When we buy meters, and indeed, we check for the meters, because we run the distribution network. The meters we buy must be good quality. Others we shall lose revenue. When we lose revenue, the regulator doesn't care. They'll cut it off because the tariff is set by them. If we lose revenue, we're in trouble. If we overcharge, we're in trouble. She'll penalize us. So other agencies like RIA, which is a government agency, Rural Electrification Agency, and, uh, and uh, other smaller dealers are allowed also to import their own meters. meters. When they bring in <coughs> their meters and they are not up to our spec, at times you, RIA can build a line and then hand it over to Umemi. But then they've installed meters that are substandard to us because people have become very clever. Wherever we plug a loophole, somebody's clever and finds another way around it. So today we are using double circuit meters so that you cannot steal the power as easily. You can't bypass. Yes, you can't bypass that, that, that easily. In the past, people were doing this. So UNBS now vets all the meters, checks them 100%. Every single one has got to be tested before it comes to memory to make sure that it's calibrated in a way that it is fair to the consumer. So the burden is not really now on us. We are held back because now there's a shortage of meters. And the longer we delay to provide meters to people, someone has built his house or shopping mall or block of apartments, he's wired and ready and you say there are no meters, he'll steal the power. You are compelling them to steal the power. They bypass you completely and get power because they need to earn a revenue. Their investment is stuck. And we are here waiting for a meter. So we have a lot of challenges and we try to balance this. So, so why, why then do people complain, especially about this yaka? Maybe it's throw some light, that you pay and don't get value from No, no, no. You see, yaka has got a system of credit and debit. When you, when you move from or migrate from a prepaid meter to a postpaid meter, you may have a bill outstanding with that meter. And when that meter is, 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 is the, the balance that was outstanding there is carried forward, we can't hit you with it immediately. So it's deducted over some time. That caused an anomaly. And then in the tariff, it isn't one standard tariff that once you pay like airtime, you pay and it's a standard tariff. Here, the tariff has been broken down by the regulator. Does it keep So that it has different times. At different time, the rate is different. Peak time, it's the most expensive. Off peak is a different rate. Um, there's a bit of almost very low cost power. The first 50 units you are given, they are given on the basis of humanitarianism. So you get the first 50 watts of power at a very low tariff. Subsidized. The next a subsidized rate by the, I wouldn't say subsidized, but at a much lower cost. Yes. And then the next tariff is a middle tier, and then there's a peak tier. Now, people don't realize so why these don't differences. You, why don't you just explain this so that you don't get a lot of stick? We are, we are at the front end of the whole electricity sector. If power goes off because of generation, omeme. If power goes off because of transmission, omeme. If power goes off because it's a distribution a problem in the distribution network, umeme. So we are, we've accepted we are the face of the electricity sector. And we'll take the bashing. And that's what we are paid for. But the regulator monitors us on our performance. We must deliver on target. We must collect the money. We must manage the losses. We must make sure we're meeting the connection targets. There are several targets that we are measured against to be able to achieve our goals. But now as chairman of umeme, you are saying that the public or sections of the public are also engaged in the fake behavior of stealing power. Uh, I checked the last time that the, the power electricity usage in Uganda is so low. The penetration is so low. Uh, so when you say that sections of the public are actually stealing the power, we still have the majority of Ugandans not having access to electricity. So, so how, how do you feel 
about that inability to, to have a complete reach. Why don't we light up the whole country? Uh, maybe that's why they are stealing. Uh, what, what do you say to that? No, it's, I've, I mentioned at the beginning, we're coming from a very low base. Omeme has been in Uganda for 15 years, now maybe 16 years. And when we came in, the penetration was much lower of the number of customers. We had less than 300,000 customers in the whole country. Which year was that? In 2006. 300,000 customers. Customers. Yeah. So in 2006, if the population of Kampala was one and a half million, you were no, covering... No, 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 no. Of Kampala, okay? Yes. You were covering less than... A third. A third of Kampala. Less than a third, of course. Even less than a fourth. So three. Because to connect a customer costs money. Imagine, a, 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 a meter costs about $50. Just take $50. So every million customers you connect, that's $50 million. All right? Somebody has got to carry that cost before you talk about the cost of the electricity. So that factor has, that's got to be factored in. When you connect a million customers, they've got to have cables brought to all those places connected. You've got to have people to do operation and maintenance and make sure the poles are there. So all these costs people don't see. They just think, oh, power in Bujagali now costs 11 cents. Why am I paying more? Power at ON4 costs two cents. Why am I paying more? They don't realize that there is a cost to an infrastructure and to maintain it. Now, these costs have got to be absorbed somewhere. Now, the government is bent on bringing down the tariff for the industrial users. And the president is clear, five cents. So we're working day and night to find a way. How can we meet at this point? Because largely our biggest problem is the blended price of buying all this power is about seven and a half or eight cents. So how do we sell it at five cents to the industrial users? Unless the ordinary person pays so much more. The homes, the tariff has to go up considerably so that we can give the factories this price. So as chairman of Umeme, what, what can you promise Ugandans listening? When do we hope to have at least 50% of the home, homesteads having access to power? We run at pace with the government because it's a political thing. Okay. If the government wanted everybody to have power, like in Kenya, they were very aggressive. It was a political agenda. Oh. It was on their manifesto. Mm. Let's give everybody electricity. They did so very fast, and now they've got high losses. And many of the people can't even afford. Even people living in a hut, a thatched hut, have got a light. But then it doesn't make sense. You cannot afford the power. Because we are still one of the poorer countries in the world. 200 countries in the world, we're like 160. Income per capita, about $600, $700, maybe $800. When you divide that by the number of days, and people have to pay for their food, their airtime, their health, they don't think about electricity. So you've got to make it a priority that I need to pay for my energy in your budget. And when people live hand to mouth, and so many do, even here in Kampala, in the urban areas, if they don't do their border board and get 20,000 per day, they don't plan that I've got to pay so much for electricity. So it's a function of looking at the whole state, the ecosystem. Slowly we are working our way up, incomes are increasing, urbanization is happening. The biggest challenge is we, don't, we need to create jobs for these young people so that they have reliable incomes not living hand to mouth. Some days they get money, some days they don't. <clears throat> I think, Patrick, you've done your part on uh, trying to get employment for the young people, seeing as uh, your vast business empire. Uh, I'm sure you employ more than maybe 2,000 people you know, within the region, or even 5,000. Uh, but back to the subject of counterfeits. Again, you are dealing in one of the most counterfeited products, uh, which is in the electronic sector. Uh, you are the first franchisee or distributor of MTN when it came here. Mm -hmm. At that time, you even spread out to Nigeria and all these other places. Uh, but we have a lot of counterfeits in the mobile telephony uh, services, which, uh, <clears throat> which, we, which, which you deal with specifically. Uh, why do you think counterfeit fake phones have grown to such an extent that one, probably out of every 10 phones, six or seven are fake, is virtually difficult to get a genuine phone on the African market, on the Ugandan market. A lot of these things come in through the briefcase. Uh, you buy it expensively, it blacks out. If you went to many of these uh, phone repair places, brand new phones are there. What, what, what do you think is the the, the reason why counterfeits in the electronic sector, in the telephone, mobile telephone sector, have grown. Is it because we don't want quality phones? No, no, phones? no. Look at the whole problem, regardless of electronics. 
when you buy a product, and let's say it's a Rolex watch, a Rolex watch will go for five thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars, whatever the price. So somebody who makes one that looks as close as possible to on the face of it as a Rolex watch, but can sell it at a thousand dollars, is doing so well. So they'll make that margin because the price is so high. When you sell a good that is perceived to be so nice, so good at such a high price, you create a gap in the market. And that's where these counterfeiters look. They jump into that market. So if you buy a, a phone, whether it's a Nokia, a Samsung, and that phone looks very good, somebody will try to replicate it and try to produce it at a price lower than yours because there will be a ready market. Because you've created a niche. Everybody wants an iPhone. Everybody wants a Samsung. So there's an, a market below that has just, is being targeted of fake products. But so, if you so make something like Renzori water and you sell it at a price as close as possible to any other water, the difference is only in the brand because there's that. Then you won't get so many people faking Renzori. So they learn to score scale and they're not going. So it's that price differential that attracts people into counterfeits. Whether it is medicines, watches, electronics, every industry has now been impacted. And I take you back now to what I call the elephant. Our society is not angry enough what do I call the elephant? There's a story of the elephant. When an elephant is born, and I, I, got to, I got to close encounter of this when I was in Thailand, and then also I found it in India. When an elephant is born and it is young, they tie its leg to a strong pole. So it tries to pull away. It keeps trying to pull away. It realizes it's futile until it's completely tired. But an elephant has got a very good memory. It will never forget that it cannot pull away. Eventually, the elephant grows, becomes strong, big and strong, that it will actually pull the whole house down. But even if you put a pole as small as this one and tie the elephant to that pole, it will not go away. You tie a simple knot and tie it there, it means it stays there because it remembers it's futile to try and pull this pole away. Now, Ugandans have learned to be subservient. Things that will enrage other people and they break away, they don't bother. So are you saying the counterfeiters have tied our legs from the time we were small to a small no. pole and we can't pull away? More or less that's what we are, a society that's accepting that. And especially goods were coming from the far east where they realize there's a huge captive market of people who are like elephants. They can't change. Sell them something. You'll find in Simba Telecom, I don't sell these counterfeit phones. phones. I stuck to branded phones and I built my name on being reliable. I built a brand. My Nokias were genuine Nokia, whether it was Ericsson, whether it was... Even now the Chinese phones, when we sell techno, it's the good quality techno. There are so many unbranded phones, names that you don't know about, that come in from China at half the price. We don't touch them, not at all. But are these guys who are bringing in the duplicates, the shiny replicas mm -hmm. of the brands that you're selling, aren't they outcompeting you? What can I say? That's the job of URA, to check everybody's goods are being checked, because there's something called pivot, where yeah. goods are supposed to be inspected before they come for authenticity. But people are not planning to pay the taxes. They're not planning for inspection. They don't really care whether these goods come through the lake on Lake Victoria, through a boat, through Masaka, and arrive here. They are undercutting us. You can't stop it. Our borders are so porous. The whole lake, the whole of the side of Tanzania, they say these goods are in transit going to Congo, they are going to South Sudan, then they dump them here. I can't do much about that. What I do know is, I've tried to build a brand around Simba Telecom where my receipt is my warranty. If you have a problem with your phone, you come back. I'll not give you a headache and I'll swap it. I'll make sure it's a good quality phone. And I built a brand around that. So people are prepared to pay a premium because a phone is something, it's an asset to somebody. It's something worth a lot of money. A where do you put, know? Patrick, where do you put, because you've talked about price, price sensitive. So where do you put those price sensitive uh, Ugandans who want a good phone? Are you saying you've locked them out? No. Why lock them out? Many feel, I'm going to buy my own phone, my iPhone. If I'm buying an expensive phone, I'll go to Dubai. I'll go to Nairobi. I'll go to London. Somewhere like that. Some realized that even there they were being duped. Then they started saying, I'll buy in Uganda from Simba Telecom because the warranty will hold. And I have no benefit in sending somebody and shortchanging for the short term. It's a very short term, uh, myopic point of view to sell something and make a bit of money today and then you don't come back tomorrow. But customers have been with me for 20 years. They keep coming back and buying the phones because they want something authentic. They have a problem, they can pick up a phone, they know who to call. If there's a problem with many of my staff, they know they, they can escalate it to me. And there's no way. My staff have got no interest in trying to shortchange somebody because they get the same pay. So make sure you do customer service. 
and we built our time, our name on Simba Telecom being a customer service people. Still on the subject of counterfeits, you are in the hospitality industry. Yeah. Again, we have found that there are a lot of counterfeits there again. We have a lot of counterfeit curry powder, we have a lot of counterfeit tomatoes, we have a lot of fake cooking oil. How is Protea Hotel, Skies and all, all the hospitality businesses that you run, how are you dealing with the issue of fake food and fake uh, deliveries that are used to prepare meals for your guests? See, when you build a business, especially a hospitality business, customer service business, it's always going to be about quality. There's so many hotels and we're all competing. So at the beginning, I get involved and it takes me time when you I start. Personally get I personally get involved, my wife is involved. We get involved in the business, know that what we're getting is quality. We get suppliers and you've got to prove you are reliable. Now it's up to you. If you bring us something that is substandard, first time we may warn you, second time you're out, you never supply us again, you're blacklisted. So we eventually get to know who our suppliers are and we have a system. You create a system that is reliable. Do you check their farms, for example? The supply of chicken, do you go to see? That's the head chef's job. Okay. My head chef will not just buy your chicken. He wants to see how you feed them, how you treat them. Are they full of antibiotics? The chef goes and visits and he will give him autonomy and he feels empowered. He makes and an you do the tests. He's the one who does the tests. So if you think you can influence a chef, that's why a chef, a head chef is an important person, a person in the hotel. He makes those buying decisions. You can't come to me as my friend, as Fred, and say, you want to supply me chicken. I'll refer you to the head chef. If he throws me if out, If he, he meets the quality, that's it. I can only open the door, introduce you. After that, it's up to you. Whether it is passion fruit, mangoes, everything, the head chef has to approve it because the buck stops with him. And if we have rubbish stuff, uh, fake royco, fake spices, whatever it is, it's the chef's problem. And he'll be on a plane. We pay him well. We look after the chef. He's an important part. He's part of the engine because the product that comes out of your kitchen is so important. People get sick, anybody gets sick, salmonella poisoning, comes and complains. We have to go to the bottom of it. Crisis, everybody check, what's happening? Now that we are not just Protea, we are Marriott. Marriott is the biggest brand in the world. They hold us to very high standards. So we can't afford to compromise. They do spot checks. Guests can even come in on behalf of Marriott and stay a few days. Mystery and shoppers. Yes, mystery shoppers, and they take notes. What you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. So you're always on your toes. We, the owners, I come here very often. I come here, they don't know when I'm coming. I have lunch in the buffet, I walk and join the customers, I see what's happening, I relate. On Sundays I'm at the skies or I'm at the, this hotel, I've got to be in different places all the time putting people on their toes. My meetings, I have them in my hotels as often as possible because I'm seeing what's happening to my customers, how they are being served. That is refreshing, Patrick, because many Ugandans, especially young people, think that a successful rich man like you, once you have all these investments, you stay home, relax, cross your legs, and, and your money works. No, no, no. For I you. am the head waiter in my hotel. I'm the head waiter. I need to make sure that the service is good. So I go to the kitchen, I walk around. If the kitchen is dirty, it's me they are worried about. Because I walk around, and I'm not doubting, I no longer doubt the quality of the food. But me, I want to know that the place is clean. Not just where they are working, the floors are clean. I go to the rubbish bin and see how they are managing that. Things that are sensitive, that's what the, the owner's eye is for. The founder's you, mentality. You just said that uh, the head chef yeah. is the most important or one of the most important members of staff of a hotel. Mm. And I notice you have a lot of chefs or the head chef is foreign or something. Does it mean you don't trust fellow Ugandans? Not that. It takes time to train them. Ugandans know how to do nearly everything here. My problem is consistency. Now we're in COVID, so things have slowed down. But when we're not in COVID, if breakfast has got to be served at 6 o'clock every day, some guests are flying in or flying out, the breakfast must be ready and the full range, the buffet, must be ready at 6. That means at 5, 4.30, people have got to be on duty. And everything that is put on presentation must be fresh. Now, my worry with our work ethic is sometimes we are there, sometimes we are not there. Sometimes we are late. We have an excuse. You have a lumbe. You have a problem. The business is like an industry. You can't deal with those same things. And I can't be involved. So the chef is there always on time. And is methodical. You must work on time. There are no ifs, no buts, no excuses. You need to provide a service that is consistent. 
And that's what we try to achieve. So you're saying that Ugandans cannot provide a consistent... I'm not saying so. It takes time to build a culture. Oh, a culture. It takes time to build that culture, a work ethic. That's why you find not just the head chef is an Indian or a South African or a German, but many of the staff even are Kenyans. The managers running around are Kenyans. There's a slight difference between their work ethic and ours. Not that Ugandans can't do the job. On a sunny day, they will do the job. What happens on a rainy day? That extra mile. That's where you need the difference. And it takes time to build this culture. Now, we, had, we lost time in our past. And somehow our work ethic dropped. And I've traveled in, and I've set up businesses in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Nigeria. And I've seen the differences. They are small cultural differences, but they are very important in business. Uh, Patrick, we're talking about our culture here. Yeah. Uh, personally, I have a big challenge uh, with this culture of uh, having barriers every day of the week somebody is sick, uh, it's really something that affects productivity. Uh, I know in Kenya, I, I went for a function there. Uh, my brother is married there and I went on a Saturday and uh, driving out of Nairobi to the, the venue of the ceremony, I saw a lot of uh, buses and so on. Each of them had coffins on the, o o o on the top. So I asked my driver, whether there was a train accident or a big, and he said, we bury on the weekends. Mm. And, and I thought that was super. Very true. Uh, why is it that you, you do everything else, you, you preach, you motivate about everything else, but you don't talk about the cultural transformation that we need in such an area? Is it because you fear to upset our culture? No, you've got to choose your market. I choose my fights. My area is financial literacy, especially to the youth. I chose that as an area where I can talk authoritatively. I may be spiritual, but I'll not go to a pulpit to talk in church. My conversation with the Lord is between me and him. But I, not, I have no authority to go and start telling people to praise God and to do certain things, or to go and talk about their culture, or what they do in their, in their pastime. If you want financial literacy, to me that became a niche market for me, where I think it's important to people, because so many go through school, and the brilliant minds go through school. They become doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, whatever they want to be. But they don't understand the language of money. Now, I didn't learn the language of money mainly through school. I did choose to do BCom. So I went to Makira at the time doing BCom. I went to London to do ICSA. But then, at the end of the day, understanding the language of money, I learned mainly on the streets. And that's the, that's the experience I bring to the young people. So they don't make the mistakes I made. Learn from my mistakes or learn from the mistakes I've heard about rather than make the mistakes or fall in the pitfalls that I went through. Talking about financial literacy, the niche that you, you chose, uh, you are always talking about how to succeed, how to succeed, what to do to succeed. But I know for a fact that to succeed, you must embrace failure. In fact, there is uh, one clip I saw uh, the American comedian, yeah. Steve Harvey, yeah. is he called Harvey? Mm -hmm. He was saying that uh, if you want to do business with him, he would ask you how many times you failed in business. If you've not failed, he will not work with you because he says you do not have uh, experience to succeed because you have not mm -hmm. failed. So two questions. How is failure a factor in succeeding? And don't you think it's time we taught the youth about failure as well, not just about success. Thank you, Fred, a good question. First of all, I'd like to put on a balance sheet. And in the old accounting system, you have assets on one side and liabilities here. Failure, if you do fail every time and you're not learning, it goes on the debit side. It's a liability. You are a liability because you're always failing, thing. yes. But if you learn from the mistake, you have moved the failure to the asset side. Positive. It's a big plus. I've learned so much from my mistakes, more than from my success. And people always talk about the success things you've gone through, the successful things you've done, without knowing what it took to arrive there. There are steps. And the main thing about failure is learn to accept it and pick yourself up quickly. The quicker you pick yourself up, because you will fall. Like when you are a kid, you are learning how to walk, you will fall. Now, the kids who are scared to fall will never learn how to walk. So you have to learn how to fall. Even when you're riding a bicycle, you learn how to fall. 
You start driving a car, occasionally you have a fender bender. You try to avoid a major accident. But you have to accept and you build a confidence. So you must take failure and embrace it, but learn from it. If you don't learn from it, it says it remains a liability. And you are an, a, a liability. So I tell people to, to go out and try. And the big thing I note about the difference in Ugandans is partic particularly is they can't accept rejection and failure. Forget the failure, it's simple rejection. I see these young people, the vendors of the newspapers, who used to walk by the streets before COVID came, try and sell you New Vision or whatever newspaper, they come to you. And you look at them, you look at the newspaper because you want to see the headline, but you don't have attention to buy. Then when you reach there, it's okay, that, go away, go away. Ugandans, when you, you do that, they, they go into a shell, the rejection. You need to keep going back, go to the next car. Don't waste time that he has rejected. Try the next customer. These people are selling fruits at the traffic lights. They keep being rejected, but they keep trying. Then you get a tough skin. You learn to accept rejection because you've got to be persistent. If you try to court a lady and you go to her the first time you ask her for a date, she says no and you run away, you never want to court somebody again. So how many times must you try? You keep going. Don't give up. No, maybe they're not that one. Go somewhere else. Each time you'll get better. Especially if you want to marry somebody very beautiful, you've got to have the confidence. I think, ah, she might refuse me. And you remain a coward and you miss out in life. Yet she was probably destined to marry you. So life is not for the cowards. No. Not you to want to look good like you. You want to be strong and have the shape of a bodybuilder. You have to go to the gym. You have to work out. If you just sit, you get flat and a big pot belly and flabby. And by the time you're 40, you look like you're 80. So certain things, you have to work on them. And then you get the results. So Patrick, have you succeeded more than you have failed or you have failed more than you have succeeded in balance yes i've succeeded more than i've failed now in the past i failed so often when i was young i tried so many businesses nobody knew about them i tried this i tried that until i made a nightclub you used to sell ice cream yes videos I buy, ice cream uh, but they were successful in their videos days. There. yes they were successful in their days when I did a nightclub, I became famous, Tropicana 110. That was oh, 30 years ago. Club. I had yes. a nightclub. And it was very popular. And I got to meet so many people. So we many people to got go to know for, me. For Discord, for Discord in, in those days, yes. They then went into the night when peace came. So I moved on. For so why did you uh, close uh, Tropicana? Why are you forcing coffee? Even Angenoa, I bought Angenoa just before I closed that. And I sold it to Charlie Vega, who is the current owner. And he took it to a different level. He, done, he done, did a very good job with it. But I used to run that too. Wow. Now, for me, when I got married, my wife told me, you can't be working all night and sleeping during the day. You've got to get a respectable job. But she wanted the money. The money was good. But I didn't have the discipline. Easy come, easy go. It was like you're hosting a party and people are paying you to host the party every night. The challenge always so, is that she may that want balance. the money mm -hmm. and also want you to be no, there. No, no, no. She, she told me enough is enough. You are smart enough to find something else to do do something else. So we closed Tropicana voluntarily. It was not closed against us. Then I sold Angenoa to Charlie. And he paid for it slowly over time. But he did a fantastic job. He made more, so much more money and ran it for a very long time. He did much better than I thought. I never had that vision. Me, it was a thing I did. And but it was Patrick, fun. it must be quite confusing for some of uh, the aspiring entrepreneurs who are listening to you. Because there is uh, a saying or a, a belief that you need to concentrate you get a line of business, you concentrate. But now you, ice cream, videos, disco, beer, telecom, hotel, power. Isn't it confusing uh, for those who are looking up to you to get into business? Shouldn't they concentrate on one thing? If I stayed doing time, videos, where would I be? If I stayed in the night, be only business, Netflix, where would I be? Maybe. No, 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 no. Not in our environment. And you see people in the first world, like Steve Jobs, he can focus on one line. Bill Gates can focus on one line and do nothing else. Microsoft is the only thing he'll do. Because the global market is his and specialist. In Africa, look at all the billionaires. They don't do one business. Dangote, the richest man in Africa. He's in oil, he's in cement, he's in rice, he's in sugar, he's, he's in, in transport. He's in everything. We diversify our portfolio because our environment is that harsh. With a stroke of a pen, the government can say, tomorrow this is closed and you're out of business. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. So in Africa, look in South Africa, Patrice Metsope, Ramaphosa, they've got diversified portfolios, very diversified. So your message is don't put your eggs in one basket. Choose what to do. 
it isn't one hat fits everybody. You, everyone has got what they can do. Some people are very good at agriculture, they stick to agriculture. Some people have an industry and they do only that industry. But even Muzei Mukwano, who was running a good industry, and my mentor, he did cooking oil, he did soap, he had gone into sweets, uh, confectionery, his tea. So he kept diversifying. He had his own trucks, fleet of trucks. He went into property, into shopping malls. People diversified their portfolio. Banking. Yeah, no, Mukwano didn't go into banking. Uh, uh, it is uh, Karim and Sudir who Karim. carried banking. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, most people fear taking risks. Uh, so they will remain in employment or they will remain doing what is safe. As an experienced and successful businessman, how important is risk as a factor in doing successful business? What I think is more important is your appetite for risk. Some people have got a strong appetite for risk, some have got a very small appetite for risk. And, and you're free. There is no set rules that the, the people who, are, who don't have appetite for risk will fail. You will not take such big risks, you will not grow as fast, you will not take as big steps as somebody who wants to run a bigger race. So, so are there some tablets for okay. appetite? For, <laughs> for getting okay, uh, the, the tablet for risk in business? Is what you study, how you are trained, how you condition your mind. It's all about the mindset. When you look at the way our government is run, our president went to the bush with 27 people. Extremely risky. 27 people say, I'm going to overthrow the government. It paid off after five years in the bush. Now he's a very careful man, the way he's running his government. He's trying to run it and almost micromanage everything. He knows everything about the country. He's so careful. So he changed completely. He had to evolve. Now, I don't want to use a political example because many people may attack me. I think of business. By the way, why don't business. you join politics? You can make a good uh, politician and lead thank us you, thank to... You. Mm -hmm. I don't know where. No, Why don't I, you join politics? I chose quite early in my life that it will be the business route and I'll try to excel in business. Is it because politics is a dirty game? Maybe in Africa it's a, a, a game that requires a much tougher skin. There is a lot of, um, of talking something and not walking that something. You can't you know, say I Africa. can't promise. Politics is All over the world. Even in America, yes, Trump is not a Ugandan. But it's not as treacherous in Africa. It's really hard to be at the helm or very high in politics without a military background now, especially in Africa. You need to have influence of the military, a wing that you control. You need to have money. You need to have politics. You need to have charisma. You have to have all these things together and you've got to expect treachery at any time. There's nobody you trust completely. I can't live like that. I want to live a life that is calm. I have friends. I have family. You love genuinely. If you want to give, you give. You're not held at ransom. When I go and I'm in the uh, up country in the, where I hail from, Iwanda, you would think I'm a politician. Because so many people come to see you and they come to your home and they support you. I'm not in for it. And they don't own me. I go there because I want to contribute. I want to make a difference in people's lives because that's what I want to do. But they don't own me. When you are a member of parliament, because they gave you their vote, they feel they own you. There is an entitlement. No one's entitled to me. It is one way. It's what I do and that's it. And I don't expect anything from them. I give love. I give whatever I can. And but you retain love. some selfishness. You've got, to, you've got to be. If you're not selfish, you cannot succeed. You cannot give when you don't have. Bill Gates is one of the biggest philanthropists today in the world. Him and his wife, Melinda, before they divorced. But he first became the richest man in the world before he could do that. But the we are told, way. Patrick, that uh, if you give, what you get is what you've given. You give to get back. That is probably in the church. <laughs> <laughs> probably but in the church. Uh, we need to okay, end this, but mm. uh, in one of your videos, mm. uh, I saw you are saying that uh, you, are, you are talking about uh, saving, and then you're saying saving is useless if you don't invest the saving, because your savings will depreciate and so on and so forth. Uh, but how do you expound on that? In, in, in the framework of a country like Uganda where investments are collapsing because of cutouts. I know people, for example, who have in invested in poultry. Uh, I have a client who invested in a poultry farm, borrowed up to six billion to put all the machines and everything, and the whole lot of birds died because they were fed on fake food. 
and, and they just blew up like that. So don't you think that some of these good ideas you are preaching to the Ugandan youth, to the African youth, will not just germinate in Africa because of the counterfeit menace. The business will collapse under the weight of facts. The business will collapse because of several other things too. Of course, one major factor is counterfeits. Now, there is no excuse. The government has got to play a bigger role because it's one of its responsibilities to regulate, to control what is coming into our country. Some of these things are poisonous to the people. Some of them cause people to lose their wealth, like this person with this chicken. Especially agrochemicals, uh, veterinary medicines, the government has really got to tighten up there. That's their responsibility. We, the public, can demand accountability because that's their job. So we have to rise up. I talked about the Rosa story. Don't go to that extreme. We're not going to go and demonstrate one day and say, we're going to remove the government if you don't stop the counterfeits. I don't think that's going to happen. The first meeting I recall, major meeting at Protea Hotel here, was when His Excellency the President came here with half of his cabinet and Baroness Choker to have a meeting here at Protea to talk about counterfeit products. Which year was that? That was 2012, I think. And the message was clearly the government will not tolerate counterfeit products. And they must put in place a mechanism. The president was unequivocal, a mechanism to check this because it is dangerous. But Patrick, since then, mm. counterfeits have grown. We are now almost 60% of whatever is in the supermarket is fake. The country has grown. Unfortunately, like I said, our country is so porous. They are trying. They are not trying hard enough, maybe. But also there are 101 problems that become priorities of the government. We've got a limited resource envelope, and our work ethic is not at that level, where we are checking, everybody's double checking for counterfeit products. But one area which is very important is the pharmaceutical industry. We need to be really tough there. And National Drug We're Authority. taking COVID vaccines. Uh, that was a small incident. You will always have a bad apple. That's how it starts. Uh, one bad apple. The vaccines that have come in this country have largely been good vaccines. The government imported them through national medical stores. One incident happened where some people bottled some water. Fortunately, there was a doctor behind it because it was distilled water. If it was ordinary water, the people would have collapsed. So at least he was careful enough to inject them with distilled water to make money, which was very unscrupulous, and it's, again, attempted murder. He should be charged. Somebody should book this group, the whole syndicate of them who are involved. I don't know if the nurses who are injecting it knew what, who was the mastermind behind this. But these are some of the irregular things that happen. But of course, we might have blown it out of it, proportion it and was, then scared people about the vaccine. It was, it was definitely an organized crime. But we are happy. Uh, you're the first guest on this show who takes a view like we hold that counterfeiting is not just a simple failure. It is a terrible thing. It is actually akin to terrorism. It's akin to murder because counterfeits actually lead to loss of life. More loss of life than, than you even have under terrorism. But before we end, my favorite subject uh, is education. And I think you need to comment on that. Uh, this uh, week, we have a sad story. Uh, the PLE results, primary living examinations, came out. And it was reported in the media that uh, a young girl hung herself on a tree because uh, uh, she had failed her exams and the neighbors were laughing at her. And uh, in the suicide note that the young girl left, she also named her enemies. <coughs> I, I think ostensibly to say uh, the enemies had dro driven her to death. Uh, two things to comment on. What is your comment about this environment we have in Uganda, where kids are put under pressure to pass exams, to get a distinction, to, and then parties are thrown all over the place because your kid got a first grade. That's number one. Two, what is your comment about enemies? Are enemies actually important as you grow? Can enemies actually help you to succeed? Robert Greene uh, says in the 48 Laws of Power, that if you don't have an enemy, create one. Do you agree with him? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. But let's go back to this tragic story about this young girl, a P7 girl who hangs herself. It is tragic, it's pathetic, it was terrible. Two things come out of that. Number one, we shouldn't push our children that passing an exam is all that matters. It does not. I, for one, was a third grader at P7. I did my P7 here at Kitante Primary School. I was a third grader. 
Today I employ you so many. You didn't get your first grade. You no look chance. like you are too sharp. No me. chance. I never. And I employ so many people with first class degrees today. I did you a third grader. I was a third grader. So it doesn't really matter. Especially at that age. Do the best you can. Give children time. Give them a chance to grow and develop all round. My children, none of them have done that. I didn't push them so hard. Tuition, go to school at 6 in the morning on Sunday. Every Children have got to play. They've got to grow. They've got to be balanced. Then they can be decent human beings. But here at times they are just driven. And with corporal punishment, some of the schools, especially around Mokono, what were caning kids so badly for results, it's not good. I disagree. But number you're a product two. of Father Grimes. He used yes, to cane us. He'd cane, but it's Saturday okay. College. He didn't cane us for academics. He's playing to in get discipline. discipline and to understand life. The role he played in my life is pivotal. Until today, I have a relationship with him. I go to visit him. I make sure I'm in touch with him on his birthday. Twice or three times in a year, I'm in touch recently with him. Recently celebrated. Yes, years, yeah. because he's an incredible man. He touched my life in different ways. Same and not, here, main, not that he was teaching me in class, yeah. but he taught you values to be rounded. And so many Namasagori students, yeah, those life skills were so important. That is one of the things. Number two is the mental state of the people in the country. We are underestimating the amount of depression that has come into our country. These kids at that age, by the time you go to commit suicide, that is untreated depression. You can't feel so abused that you go into a deep depression. It's like going into a deep hole. You can't come out. And the act of taking your life is terminal, it's complete, it's irreversible. That is terrible. So we need to address mental state of the people. Butabika is full of mental people, mainly because of alcohol or drugs. And depression. And poverty. Okay, poverty, we've done, we've lived with poverty. Does every poor man kill himself or go into depression? We've learned to live with it. We are like weeds. There was a time in Amin's days we had nothing. I went to school in Namasagari. It was posho and beans. You're lucky to get that. Maize, duma, duma, oireo. We'd come running for food. So we can survive on so little. When you look at the pictures of Ugandans by the time NRM came to power, we are all skinny, very lean. Now you look at the population and look at everybody, how they live. Yes, there's poverty, but we survive. So I can't say it's poverty on its own. It's a mental state of being and depression. People need to feel cared for belong a sense of belonging those are important things so i don't think people should compete so much in exam for exams give people time everybody's time will come my time came later and i started doing things better than my contemporaries better than my peers better than a few of those ahead of me everybody's time for t uh, will come when you can do certain things so don't push everybody in one race it's not a race the only race you're running in life is the race against yourself Try to be a better person every time. And the issue of the enemy? An enemy. Of course, the only, the everybody has rule, enemies. The only rule I, I, I embraced from Robert Greene's book is rule number one. Never outshine the boss. That's the only one. The rest of his rules are interesting to read, but I didn't embrace them. I felt they'll make, they won't make you a, a better person. I don't look for enemies. I know as an adult, if you're anybody who's above 18 and you don't have an enemy, either you're a complete loser or you don't have <laughs> principles. If you're principled, some people will hate you. Or you're a loser, just go around life like that, and everybody loves you. You can't live like that. A person with values, with principles, some will agree with you, some will disagree. You'll have someone, they call them enemies. So you can succeed irrespective of You've who likes to, you. Yes, and the higher you go up the ladder of success, you need to have a tougher skin. People will write all kinds of things about you. And they'll expose you because anything you do when you're up there is amplified. Especially the wrong things, they'll be amplified. You're, like you're being given a microphone with a very powerful amplifier. amplifier. Anything I do will go all over the country. So I've got to be extra careful. So, so the message to the haters, who for us here yeah, we shall run down the <laughs> haters as well, uh, is that uh, they can do all the hate they want. It's okay. Uh, but keep focused. You stay on your uh, path. Stay on course. Plan your path. And uh, achieve your goals that you have set. Be a better person. Try to be a better person every day. The last word, uh, Patrick. Uh, there are so many drivers of counterfeits. Here we have uh, depreciation. People can depreciate. Convenience. Affordability. Uh, people don't know the concealed dangers. People aspire. Aspirations also. I want to have that Rolex watch. Uh, ineffective uh, cooperation or negligence of the brand owners. Which one of those for you is a big driver for counterface? And what can we do to stop the proliferation of counterface in the market as you close? You see, the government 
is our government. The government is not somebody out there who's a, 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 anonymous or oblivious of what we're doing. We hold them accountable. We vote them in every five years. If we make it a priority that check certain things, they will make it a priority. If we choose to lobby hard, and there are organizations like Private Sector Foundation, Chambers of Commerce, that can lobby. Institutions like the pharmaceutical, the health workers, they can lobby. Even us here, we are lobbying just right now. This is what you're doing. The stronger your lobby is, the better. Whatever government does, they do with taxpayers' money, our money. We pay for the services they provide. Especially those who pay big taxes must make sure. You, when there was a, a lot of cigarettes coming through, BAT used its lobby and influence to try and block these cigarettes that were coming into the country. Yeah. Yes. And they managed to check them largely because they used their muscle. The breweries, they do the same thing. They created a tax system so that imported uh, products or uh, beverages are taxed so much more. The government is now encouraging buy Uganda, build Uganda. So long as we manufacture genuine products, that's where the market should be. We need to embrace industrialization. Already, I saw last time you were talking about a genuine COVID X, a fake COVID X. We should stop bickering about the petty things. Focus on helping Ugandans grow as a country. We need to embrace industrialization, create jobs for the youth, and prosperity for everybody. Let's leave nobody behind. And most importantly, the best you can do in the fight against counterfeits is not to provide a market for the counterfeit products and services. I think we have to end here. This has been uh, our guest of the month, uh, Dr. Patrick Bitature, Chairman Simba Group, uh, Honorary Council. Australia. Uh, Australia. <laughs> Australia or Austria? Australia. Australia, Australia down yeah. south, yes. down under. Yes, down under. He has, he's a man wearing many hats. Uh, he's on many boards. He's a chairman of many companies. But thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and, and thank you for uh, gracing uh, this platform to add your voice uh, in this important fight against counterfeit. So until the next episode, uh, we shall urge you to buy and sell genuine products only. Thank you.